What we want to talk about tonight is uh, I want to take you back to that story where uh, I crashed a van into a tree, right? And uh, our friend Will over here has a big scar on his face. Well, uh, the short of it is that I ended up in court over that whole deal because I tried to convince the officer that Will was driving or that my girlfriend was driving, actually. My girlfriend who wasn't even in the car. I tried to convince uh, the officer that my girlfriend was driving and the officer saw me with blood and glass and then saw my girlfriend completely pristine and was like, mm, doesn't take Sherlock to figure this one out. So he asked me for my license and I said, I don't have one. And he said, that's gonna be a problem. I said, I know. So I found myself in court uh, charged with several things, actually. I was charged with uh, driving without a license, obviously. And then I was charged with like uh, damage of property. I don't remember the, the official stuff. It's been like 20 years. But uh, because I crashed into a telephone pole and you would think AT&T would be nice about this. They're not. <laughs> Right? They wanted their money, right? And uh, they, they were trying to charge me like $13,000 for destruction of their, of, their, uh, of their tree. And then another charge was something along the lines of like endangering the life of a minor. And it was Will. I was like, he's hardly a minor. <laughs> right? So you, I don't know. It was, it was reckless. You weren't a minor. It was something else, some other charge. But um, I was in the courtroom, and I remember being in the courtroom, and I'm sitting there, and um, the... Lawyer, I mean, the judge is looking at my sheet, right? And he's looking at me, and uh, he just asked me, like, hey, did you do this? I'm like, yeah, I did. I was like, yeah, it was me. And um, I'm guilty as charged, right? Uh, there's really no recourse for me until uh, the lawyer, I think, he looks in the back and sees my mother fidgeting. He doesn't know it's my mother. He looks back. Who's that? And my mother's in between. She's on the bench, kind of like kneel down. And the judge says, who's that? I said, that's my mother. I said, what is she doing? She, she, Your Honor, she's praying. Right? And seeing her pray, awoke, 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 awoke awakened. Mm -hmm. Something in him <laughs> where uh, he began to see me through his own experience. And his experience he shared in that moment was one in where he had been a troubled youth who had a praying mother, and he ended up on the bench as a judge. And uh, he subsequently began to see me, not through the list that was in front of him, but began to see me through the humanity that he himself had lived. And in seeing me through the humanity that he himself had lived, all of a sudden, that sheet didn't matter. It was two-dimensional. All of a sudden, he had a three-dimensional person in front of him because he saw that person through their humanity. Ended up just giving me parole, not parole. <laughs> <laughs> My name's really not Jonathan Leonardo. <laughs> he, uh, he ended up giving me probation for a few months. I was like, seemed like a good kid. Seemed like you got a good mom. You know, just don't come back here. I was like, I won't. And uh, regrettably, I've never seen him again. All right? Or thankfully, I've never seen him again. I, uh, I didn't appreciate the power of that. I didn't appreciate the power of that moment until many years later. And I got to be honest with you, I didn't appreciate the depth of what, maybe, I didn't appreciate it in light of what I'm about to say. We've been talking about marks on the body, yeah? We talked about the body marks, talked about how they come, how they go, talked about this relationship, Tyler Morgan. And um, because of those things, we will present ourselves before God a particular way. So here you had me, you know, and you can, and I'm carrying all those, those marks, the ones we've spoken about. You good? And for those who are joining us for the first time, we've been talking about how we identify with sins that are committed against us and how they mark us. And they will mark us with what we use is that, you know, we, we've been alone, we've been marked by uh, being betrayed, we've been abandoned, right? There's been moments of rejection. There's been violation. There's been shame. And uh, I just want to give credit to where I actually got this idea that revealed it to me. It was a, a pastor by the name of Paul Conniff. I don't know if any of y'all know who he is but he has a great book called The Hidden Half of the Gospel. And he talks about how we have victory 
from sin, right? We're free from sin like we've talked about in wave one. But then he also says that the other half of the gospel is that now we're healed by him, right? Now, so that's where I began to see these ideas. And, and he makes this connection that he shows that we tell our story through these marks. Just like I was in front of the judge and he's telling my story through what's marked on a sheet of paper, yeah? But you know what switched it for him? The moment he saw me through his humanity, right? So watch what happens is that through, through what Jesus Christ has done, right? Through what Jesus Christ has done at the cross, he has borne all of these marks. So he has identified with us, yeah? So that we in turn, through him, we in turn, through him, might now live according to, right? Life, resurrection power. So that we're identified no longer with these marks, but through him we're healed so that we're identified with resurrected life. Now, watch, this is, this is Jesus, yeah? But then, this is us, right? This is us, and now what are our marks? We are whole, we are restored, right? We are redeemed, right? We are without blame, right? We are, uh, uh, give, give me someone else. What else? Free. We're free. Amen. We're free. What else? Let me draw. Uh, no shame. No shame. What else? What's that? Pure. Pure. You know, these are all the things that now mark us. We good? Righteousness. I mean, we can, we can go on and on. I'm sitting there in front of the judge. I'm going to be 100% honest with you. How do you think I was identifying myself? Guilty. Why? Because I did it. I did it. Not only did I do it, but because of what I did, my best friend has a mark for the rest of his life. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and so that marking is ever present before me. So the way I'm seeing myself is through the story I'm telling myself. But when the revelation came, when the revelation came, when the revelation came, I understood the way I was truly seen. And in being seen this way, my story is no longer told through the marks that either I received or the marks I put on another. My story is told through the marks that he received. Yeah? I got another mark. Now, this isn't an endorsement. It isn't a, a, uh, a negation either. This just is what it is. We good? I got a tattoo. All right? I don't know if you can see it. But if you can see it, it's a cross. And on the other side of the cross is a period. And the reason I got this marked is precisely because I had a revolutionary shift in my life that I personally, no endorsements, I personally decided to mark. And that was that who I am and my whole life is absolutely revealed at the cross, period. Because at the cross, my value was revealed to me through his sacrifice. When he was willing to be marked with every single thing I received the truth of my value that he would go that far from me. Y'all have heard me share the story. I don't want to go too far deeper in it. I actually have a friend of mine who's here tonight. There you are. Bibi, come on up. Bibi's going to share a little bit about her journey and marks of the body and how she's learned to live through the cross, period. Hi, family. Um, I'm actually going to sit. Y'all okay with that? 
Okay. Great. Oh, okay. Oh, that's fine. This this good? Okay. Cool. Um All right. So a couple things. I guess I want to start <sighs> I'm fine. With three things. So one, I'm going to be using note cards. I'm not cool like Jonathan. You can just speak it off the top. But I'll do my best. Um, two, we've been getting really real. And it's not going to stop. So I'm going to say what I need to say and be honest. And that might not be pleasant to hear. But it's going to be all right. Right? That's right. And um, third thing, I just want to say a word of prayer with y'all before I get started. So um, let's do that. Lord, I want to call upon your name, the name above all names, that name that holds power and creation and life that name that already has victory, that has won and defeated. Lord, let that name and that power fill this space. There is nothing else here because darkness cannot be where light is. Lord, open ears, open hearts, open minds. You created them, Lord. They are yours, God. Holy Spirit, fall in this place. Hide me behind your cross and let my tongue speak your words. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Okay, so um, let's see. Where am I starting? Um, the beginning. All right. And then when I get to the end, I'll stop. Um, so... Uh, I grew up a religious. Um, Christmas was about Santa. Easter was about eggs and the Easter bunny. I think we went to church maybe twice because family was in town, you know. But we didn't really, God was never really a part of the conversation. And so um, my home was also pretty chaotic, just very violent, um, very scary place to be. And so from a young age, um, that left physical marks on my body and also some other marks by words that were spoken over me, right? Words like unlovable, unworthy, let's see what else, irresponsible, dumb, selfish, crazy, dramatic, I could go on and on. Um, and so because of those marks that were put on me, that led me to put marks on my own body, put things into my body that left marks, put marks literally on my body it led me to make choices with my body that left marks on it. Led me to places that allowed marks to be put on it, to be taken advantage of. Um, and so, that's how, that's how I viewed myself, was through was through these marks, because what else did I know? I didn't know anything else, yeah? So um, during all this time and craziness, I'm about 17, and my dad takes my brother and dips. And just me and my mom for a while, and we don't talk to them for about a year, we don't know where they are. Um, and so uh, about, yeah, about a year, about a year after, 
my mom gets a call from my auntie. They've been with my auntie down in California. And um, then probably about six months after that, I go, all, uh, yeah, I go off to college. And at my college, for a freshman orientation, it was a three-week-long backpacking trip. Because, you know, private liberal arts school. <laughs> what else are you going to do? <laughs> right? Self-discovery, all that. Um, <laughs> so I'm on this three-week long backpacking trip. And I, we have like a break before school actually starts. So I call my mama at the airport. I'm like, hey, mom, I'm coming home. And she's like, oh, great. I'm on the way to church with your dad. Yeah, exactly. That guy's face. He was like, yeah. And I was like, what? And so I had this whole like plane ride home, just like, what? <laughs> How? Um, both to church and to my dad. And so I get home, and um, my dad's there. My brother's there. And my dad sits me down, and he confesses. He confesses to me, and he starts to cry. Now, up until that point, I didn't know that this man was capable of emotion. And I'm not exaggerating. I didn't know it was possible. And um, then he apologized. And I was so overwhelmed. I didn't know what to do with it. And he told me that he had gone to um, Army Bible Camp, Ivor Myers. And um, while he was there, he was praying, and he was like, God, just like, I'm just so done with my marriage, my wife, my blah, da, 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 all this stuff. And the Lord just broke him, showed him himself for the first time. He had always seen himself as a victim, and for the first time, he saw himself as a perpetrator. And it cracked him wide open. And um, he shared this with me, and he said, I'm sorry, will you forgive me? And I told him no. I told him that I can't believe you because I've known this about you for my whole life. So I need to see it. I need to see that it's real before I can accept this apology. And um, God is so good, isn't he? That man is the sweetest kindest, softest man I know. He cries all the time now. <laughs> and he's so strong. He's my hero. Yes, God is so good. And so I'm seeing this change, this real change in my father. And he said it's from this God of the Bible, right? And I was like, there's got to be, there's got to be something to this. Like, there's no way that he could do a complete 180 because he wanted to. You know? It's not possible. It was, it was literally impossible. I witnessed a miracle. And so I got a Bible and I just started reading it. Genesis, <laughs> Exodus, and I'm just reading this Bible and I don't know what I'm reading. I have no idea. Um, They end up moving to California, and I start going to church. And so I go to, like, the Adventist of Adventist churches, right? <laughs> um, so, like, um, what I mean is there's only an organ. That is the only instrument. Um, they don't drink coffee. Yo, guys, when I came here and I saw that there was a coffee pot in the young adults room, I was like, what is this place? Wow. Um, uh, women don't wear jewelry, like turtlenecks, long dresses, men in three-piece suits. And don't get me wrong, they were so wonderful, so loving, so welcoming. Welcoming to this girl with short red pixie cut hair, giant hoop earrings, v-neck shirt, 
jeans ripped up to the thigh, like sneakers, cursing like a sailor. And they were just like, come in, sweetie. <laughs> come on in. Come, have some haystacks. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, so I started uh, going to this church. And for me, the reason why I chose an Adventist church, it was pretty, it was pretty easy. Um, I, re- I was just reading my Bible, and it said, keep the Sabbath day. Dope. Who does that? Oh, I also believed that the world was ending, and I started reading prophecy. I was like, oh, it's real. I believe Jesus is coming back, so Seventh-day Adventist. There we go. That's me. <laughs> you know? So, yeah. And so um, I go, I'm going to this church for a little bit, and um, I'm in the back row, One day, and a guest preacher comes, Chris Camado. No, that's fine. Um, I think he preaches out in Sandy or Bend or something. Anyways, it doesn't matter. It's besides the point. Um, And his sermon is on baptism. And he's talking about how you have this book, and... Your life is written in this ink, right? And your sins and all that is written in this ink, and it's heavy. It's heavy. And what baptism does is you go down in that water, and that book is closed and gone forever. And you come up out of the water, and it's, you get a fresh book. It's not even a fresh page. It's a fresh book. He said, does anyone want that? <laughs> Me. So with my thigh high ripped up jeans I just run up to the front with for this altar call and um, that's when I let God know me I said yes please come into my life Jesus I want this whatever this is please please give it to me that was back in like 2011 yep Maybe 2000, I don't know, somewhere in there, you know. Um, And so it took me, it took about four years to actually get in those waters. Um, But when I did, man, what a beautiful gift that we receive. I get the most hype at baptisms because, you know, we're witness, it's like, it's a birth, a wedding, and a miracle all in one. We get to just sit and what? Like, we get to just sit and experience that? That's crazy. It's crazy. And, like, yeah, I just remember I went down in those waters and I came up and it was like nothing was different and everything was different. All at the same time. You know, the Matrix, when he, like, unplugs? I got unplugged and it was a beautiful thing. (laughs) And so... Um, yeah, so from, from that point on, um, I was just, Hui and I, my husband, if you don't know him, we got baptized the same day, we got baptized together, and that, I know, I know, and it was right before we were married, and it was so great, God is so good, um, but uh, so the day of our baptism, we're, we were, see, we had a little bit of an ego. We we're like, we're going to start a Bible study. The first Bible study was the day of our baptism, right? We go into the Bible study. One dude shows up. It is a researched, like, like researched, college-educated educa- atheist. He brought like four different versions of the Bible and was like, I'm ready for y'all. Let's go. And we were like, oh, we're not ready. We're not ready for you. <laughs> we, were just, we were so cocky. Um, but it was, you know, God really taught us through that. And we learned a lot because he had all the hard questions. And we had to find the answers. And we did. And so, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm just going through life, being a Christian, telling people how this world's not real and it's made of plastic and it tastes like cardboard 
and there's so much more. And um, like, Jesus loves you, you know, doing that thing. And like, it was powerful and people heard. Um, but even though, see, here's the thing. Even though I believed that Jesus died for my sins, I was still letting them be my definers, right? So even though I had had that baptism experience and I had accepted Christ, I was still defined not only by the sins that I committed, but by all of those words that were spoken over me. Yeah? And like those sins that had been committed against me as a child. So then Jonathan, this dude comes. And um, this was just earlier this year in February. And so he's teaching Sabbath school and he starts talking about sanctification, I think. And he was like, yeah, you're righteous. And I was like, oh, okay. Okay, hold up, hold up, hold up. We need to stop here because um, I don't know if you know what you're talking about. Like, really, I, I was, it was really, really hard for me. And um, see, this is why, because this is what I am, this is what I thought was, I got baptized, therefore I'm justified. And I have my whole life is a process of sanctification. And if I've done that well enough, when I meet Christ face to face, then maybe I'll get into heaven, right? Or he'll accept me, not get into heaven. That's, that's not what I meant, but he'll accept me. But I also knew that my God is good and my God is just, so he would never accept me. Yeah? And so Jonathan's speaking this thing about how, like, basically he's like, no. <laughs> And um, I get really hot, so I have to, like, open a window. I'm, like, jumping up and down on my chair. I, like, this thing that he's, like, telling me is so radical that I'm having a physical reaction. Like, I physically can't handle what he's trying to tell me. And so we go into, um, we come in here, and he does the prodigal son sermon. Everyone's like, oh, yeah, I know, I know. Um, and two things came out of that. One, uh, this idea that I was never not daughter. <sighs> two, he was talking about how when we come to God and we're groveling and we're like, oh, God, please forgive me, please accept me. And I was like, yeah, duh. That's how we come to God, right? And he was like, no. Because that's not how a son and a daughter comes to a father. Um, and... The reason why it was so hard for me to accept this is because, right, so I told you that I let God know me, right? And so if he knew me, if he really knew me, how could he love me? Like, not, you know, like, how could he actually accept me? Because he's good, and he sees my ugliness, Right? And so, Jonathan's saying this thing, and it hits me. Like, God is just like, yes, this is it. This is how I, you know, like, this is how I see you. This is who you are. And I just fall apart. I just fall apart, and I'm on my knees, and I'm crying, and it's like, you know, when your throat is, like, wet? from like the tears, you know, it's like that bad, and, <laughs> or good, and I'm crying, and my knees start to ache, right, 
And I'm like, no, I got to stay postured in this position because I'm so grateful. And in that moment, God speaks to me so clearly. He says, get up. Get up. All of these people have said all these things about you. I never said that about you. I've said, daughter. Now get up because your knees are hurting. What are you doing? You're tripping. Get up. (laughs) And I got up. And that's when I knew him. That's when I knew him. So after that, I got like half free. So I let him know me. I knew him. And I understood his character in that moment. Truly who he is. And, um, And the next day, he has me start writing these letters. So I'm writing these letters to my mom, to my dad, to just, lot, just people in my life. And they're not intended to be sent or anything. But with each letter, he, starts, he has me be really honest, and then he has me forgive and release them from what they've done to me. Because they don't owe me anything. Because he paid it. And the more that I'm, each letter that I'm writing, these chains are just coming off of me, like un, like unraveling from my heart. And I realize that the enemy has just given them to me, and I just accepted them without even questioning. And the Lord just freed me from that freed me one at a time and so a few months go by and Jonathan comes back and um, we're sitting in my house and actually Justin and Christian are there too and I'm telling them about this very real thing that I feel which is that everybody hates me And I'm not exaggerating. I'm not being dramatic. Like, I truly, actually believed that everybody hated me. So, for an example, I hadn't talked to my friend in a long time. And I texted him. And I'm like, hey, I love you so much. I miss you. Like, right? Like, all that stuff. And he sends me back a heart emoji. And I was like, oh, my gosh. He hates me. No, it's not funny. It's not. It was so real. I was like, he got together with this person and this person, and they talked about how horrible I am, but he's such a nice guy that he feels like he has to respond. So he sent me back an emoji so that he doesn't have to like hurt my feelings, right? Maybe two hours later, I get a text from him, and he's like, hey, I'm going to propose to my girl this weekend. He loves me so much. What was that? Deception. <laughs> for real. And so I'm telling them about this, and um, the normal reaction or response that I usually get is um, Jonathan was talking about this maybe yesterday sympathy. I was like, oh, what are you talking about? No, that's not, you know, da da da. Like, da, oh my gosh. Or like, I get it, but like that, right? And <clears throat> I think it was Christian. He said something so simple to me. He just looks at me and goes, if that was true, we wouldn't be here. Done. I was like, you're right. And I'm explaining, like, my ideas around sanctification. And Justin, he goes, that's awful. (laughs) I'm like, you're right. (laughs) That is awful. And then Jonathan So I'm, I'm talking, and I'm like, I was starting to cry, and we're reading scripture, and I'm like, oh, this thing is so deep. It's just been buried. And Jonathan's just like, nah, stop. Stop right now. There is no seed. That's not deep. It's not buried. It's gone. That's a lie. And he asked me, he goes, what is it? What is it about you that people hate? I couldn't answer. I did not have an answer. I didn't know. I could not The enemy, I was just so steeped in deception 
that the enemy didn't even need to give me an answer for me to believe it. And Jonathan goes, yeah, so it's a lie. It doesn't matter. And I was like, you're right. You're right. And in that moment, I knew who I was. Yeah? And once I understood who I was, he knew me, I knew him, and I saw me through him. I'm free. Truly. I'm free from myself. Jonathan was like, die already. I did. I did. Hallelujah. Yo, I was so over myself. I was so tired of myself, so consumed with myself. And it's gone. I'm dead. That girl, dead. Dead. Isn't that a gift? Mm. But also... I'm free from you. I'm free from the world. I'm free from expectations. I'm free from desires. I'm free from my parents. I'm free from my exes. I'm free from my body. I'm free from your eyes on my body. Yeah? Pastor George? I just want to say something before he goes. I want to apologize to you, and I'm going to just speak it right now. We're never getting out at 8. We're probably always going to get out at like 8.15, 8.20. Just Who can believe what we just heard? Can you believe what we just heard? Who can believe such a thing is even possible? I'm reading from Isaiah 53. He was despised. He was rejected. A man of sorrow, acquainted with grief, as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our grief. What did Peter say? He himself bore our sin in his body on the tree. Do you believe that? Amen. He himself bore our sin. He himself bore all of this. All that has been done to us, all that we've done to others, he bore it in his body on the tree. But we looked at him and said, this man has been stricken, smitten by God. It's God who's turned against him. Hmm. But he was wounded for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. 
And here it is. With his stripes, we are healed. Amen. With his stripe, what he, what he took and what he bore in his body, taking all of that, with his stripes, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And here it is. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Can you say amen to that one? All of it. All of it. So BB7 says, how could he love me if he knew everything about me? This, this, is the, this, is, this is what makes grace so amazing. He knows everything about us. He knows every thought. He knows every action that flowed from those thoughts. He knows it all. And he looks at us and he calls us daughter and he calls us son and he says, I love you. I love you so much I give my life for you. I give my life to you. He was oppressed, he was afflicted and he didn't open his mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughter, like a sheep before its shear is silent, he doesn't open his mouth. He's there and saying, no, I'm going to see this through. He'd opened his mouth the night before. The night before, he opened his mouth when he said, Father, is it possible to take this cup? Would you please take this cup from me? If not possible, not my will, but yours. And now he's there and he's going to receive it. He's going to receive all of it. All the ugliness, all the brokenness, all the cruelty, all the meanness, all the, everything, the, dark, the darkest part of us. He says, I'm taking this. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. As for his generation, who even realized what was going on here? He was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people, and they didn't get it. They didn't even know what was going on. They didn't, they didn't see it. They didn't know. They made his grave with the wicked, hung between hung between two, two people a lot like us. Two people just like us. Although he had done no, and a rich man in his death, laid in a tomb, wealthiest man in the, in the country. There was no deceit, he had done no violence, no deceit in his mouth. And here it is. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. Don't misunderstand this. Please, don't see this like, you know, I sinned. God is mad. He's going to go over here and beat up Jesus. That's a lie. That is not true. This is father and son as one. This is father and son as one who comes and goes, Cain, where's your brother? And Cain cops an attitude. Am I my brother's keeper? Oh, how I wish Cain in that moment. How I wish I have always followed this, but just, just fall to my knees and just go, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. And at that point, he goes, I forgive you. I forgive you. I forgive you. And that consequence, that consequence, I'm taking it on myself. So this is not God beating up his son on a cross. This is the Godhead, Father, Son, and Spirit united as one. Say, we're going to bear this thing. We're going to carry this weight. And this weight is heavy. When it says it's the will of the Lord to crush him, we don't know this, but everybody there knew it. All the guy, everybody present knew that Gethsemane meant the place of the olive press where the olives would be picked and they'd be put in bags and they'd be stacked and those stones, those huge stones, you can see them today. You go to the Garden of Gethsemane, you can see it and you can see those stones dropped on those olives in order to squeeze the oil out of them. This, this place of crushing is this place of one, the Lamb of God, who says, I'm going to take it all. I take all the consequence of all the ugliness, all the evil, and don't just think the whole world. Think of your own. And it's there that it falls upon 
and it crushes. It says it's the will of the Lord that that they, that he would bear this weight. When his soul makes an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring. You go, what? What's that mean? The will that he shall prolong his days. The will, the will of the Lord will prosper, huh? He's come to an end. He's been killed. He's been, he's been laid in the ground. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see. You go, out of the anguish of his soul, you'll see what? And there's a little note, and you look down at the bottom, you go, that's what the text said for 2,000 years. And then we discover those Dead Sea Scrolls that were 1,000 years earlier, and suddenly you discover in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it says, out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see light. After 3,000 years, the truth is told that had been lost. And the truth is that the one who was crushed is in that crushing and in that death. There was no sin in him. Death could not hold him. And on the third day, he saw light. On that third day, he rose victorious. A mighty triumph for his foes. He is alive. And he is alive that day and he's alive today. And he is alive here in this place. And you and I come to life in him. This is what we mean when we say Jesus. This is exactly what we mean when we say Jesus. We're not talking history. We're not talking, oh, I believe in nativity. No, this is Jesus, the living one, who is present. And how does Paul say it? I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Amen? So that's our life. He is our life. I love those words way back in Deuteronomy 30 where he says, Hey guys, I am your life. I have no good thing apart from him. Oh, I get a lot of stuff. I might even be able to stretch out years. But I come alive when I come alive in Jesus when I say yes to him and that resurrection life which I always thought as a kid growing up and even into my adulthood I thought oh well that's someday when Jesus comes again and I go no 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 he's saying now he's saying now through the presence of the Holy Spirit as we receive and say yes to Christ that we come alive in him anybody want that? anybody want it? if you want it come up here right now Come here. We're going to finish reading this, but if you want that, come on up. That's the Jesus you want. Come on here. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see light. He will see light and he will be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. That's you and me. We get to be counted as his daughters and as his sons, we are counted as his. Why? Because he bears our iniquity. He takes it all. All of it. All the junk. All the stuff. All of it. And he says, therefore I'll divide him a portion with the many. He'll divide the spoil with the strong. Why? Because he poured out his soul to death. He was numbered for transgressors. He bore the sin of many. And here comes present tense. He makes intercession for the transgressors. You and I are set free in Jesus now, tonight. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Amen.